Right, guys, did you know that around 85% of you who listen to the show haven't yet hit the subscribe or like button? It's not on that, is it? No, nah, it's rubbish. So if you have found any value in watching or listening to the podcast, click like, follow, or subscribe. It helps us so much. And the bigger this show gets, the bigger Jackie's head gets. All right, mate, chill out. So thanks, guys. Enjoy the episode. Yes, lads. Do you know where the afters is? <laughs> I'm in. We're in. We're in again. I don't normally take ibuprofen, neither, actually. They're not, not good for your gut health. I'm just going to preface the podcast with uh, <laughs> ibuprofen advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, always. Well, Steve, uh, a.k.a. SKT, welcome to the afters, mate. How you doing, man? You good? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good. It's good to actually properly meet you and sit down with you as well. Well, we just yeah. t- said that on the way up here. I said, have we like we bumped into each other at, you know, in shores, in the, <laughs> in the booth, wherever? You never, ever get a chance to actually sit and talk. Mm. So like, this is really... This this has been the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. So everything good though? Yeah, been really good. It's been um, super busy uh, this year. This year's just been absolutely mental so far and the summer's looking crazy as well. So yeah, looking forward and to this it, year. And the summer's closing in rapidly. Yeah. It's fucking <laughs> almost April, man. Um, you want to start with the, with the intro? Yeah, of course. Go for it. Just letting them have it happen. Nice. <laughs> well, um, obviously we know who you are. But for those at home who don't, who the fuck are you? <laughs> um, I'm a DJ and producer based in London. Been making music since about 13 years old. Um, also have a show on Kiss once a week. And yeah, just been DJing and producing since ever. Yeah, man. I remember sending some tunes to you. I can't remember when it was, but you you were you were cracking on well before that, man. You've, <laughs> you've, you've, you've been around, man. So you've done it for a little while. Well, let's go back a little bit then. So the, your origin story into music. Kind of, what does that look like? When did you really st- take that jump to, you know, touring? Because everyone has this journey of. We always ask people what's the journey into music, but like, what's your journey into doing this full time? So, um, I got my first uh, pair of decks when I was like 13 years old. I bought them off uh, my PE teacher at school for like 100 quid. He gave me a load of old records as well. They were Sound Lab belt drives at the time, which were terrible, but they they worked, kind of thing. So. Um, then I studied music, um, music technology at like 16 and I saw an advert for the Technics DMC under 18s uh, UK championships. And I'd been practicing for a couple of years, so I submitted the tape, didn't think anything of it. Um, and then literally a couple of months later, I got a letter to say, congratulations, you're in the, semi, uh, the quarterfinals, I think it was. Um, so I got an amazing opportunity to play in all these nightclubs as a 16 year old kind of doing tricks. Wow, amazing. To like thousands of people and oh the from, probably DMC yeah yeah, yeah, oh, yeah right. for the under 18s Sick. yeah all right cool. scratching and that yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> amazing yeah. i didn't know you did that yeah. that's wicked so i ended up coming like fourth in the country in that and then i was like right i'm sold this is what i want to do and then if, uh, i think like the year after that radio 1 did one and um it was judged by like the dream team Mikey B DJ Spoonie and um, I did really well, well in that as well. I think I came like sixth uh, in the UK. Right. Um, so from that, it just gave me the experience of like, all right, cool, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. What music were you, were you playing at back then? Back then it was garage mostly. Yeah, yeah. A little bit house, but mostly garage was the thing, like early 2000s. And yeah, it was a really fun time as well, music-wise. Mm. It's mad when you say 2000 now, because <laughs> I still, I always think in my head 2000, I think, oh, Five years ago. Yeah, <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's fucking like, time ago, mate. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, people that I speak to now that are like, yeah, I was born in 2001. Yeah, like, yeah. what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> yeah, that's scary. <laughs> when? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was why you started. So then how did you kind of transition into like what you do now? What's that journey look like for you? So from then... <clears throat> From there, I met um, I met a guy that was like a promoter in North London, was doing loads of clubs like Heros in Enfield, Rudolph's in Tottenham, Opera House in Tottenham as well. And he was on Pirate Radio as well. And I kind of said, oh, I can DJ. So I gave him a CD, he listened, and he said, all right, cool, I'll tell you what, you can open up for my raves and stuff, and I'll pay you in beer. And then I was, I was 16 at the time, so I thought, this is amazing. <laughs> So I got to play all these wicked like uh, club warm ups from like nine till ten, free beer, and you know there'd be like the bigger DJs like DJ EZ um, coming to headline at the club. So I started getting really used to playing out and um, almost 
kind of becoming a resident and um, I just thought, you know what, I'd love to be able to play my own track in here just to see how it how it would go down. So was making loads of stuff anyway, started doing a few remixes and just playing them out at gigs. And then I'd get other DJs coming up to me saying, oh, what's this? Um, so then I just started, um, I found an advert. Do you remember Rewind magazine? Yeah. So I found an advert in the back of there for a, a place you could go and press records. And what, so how old were you when you started making music then? What what age were you when you started? Kind of 13. Okay, oh, so it was really young when you started then. Okay, yeah. so because a lot of people would get on, especially me, I was like 19, 20 when I actually started making was, yeah. dance music. Yeah, probably. Like, so that's that's obviously from a young age. So sorry, yeah, sorry, carry on. 13 and then I put out my first record when I was 16 and just found this wow. record uh, plant down in Wembley, turned up there with like a CD and a uh, really nice guy, Nick, um, I can't remember his surname, mastering guy, went in, he cut everything to vinyl, a week later picked up the vinyl and then just went around to all the stores like Uptown Records, Black Market, Rhythm Division, in Bow, UDM and Enfield. I'm a little moped with like 500 <laughs> records in a sports bag wow. and just kind of went in and say, hey, I've got a record and it worked. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> the, like the shops were just like, oh, these these are cool. We'll take them on sale or return. And then I'd had, I'd, I was going to college at the time and I'd have this big list of all the stores, like how many units were owed. And um, yeah, I did that for a couple of years. And then the records just started picking up traction where stuff started getting played on like radio, like big club DJs started picking up on the records. And then next thing I remember getting a, <clears throat> getting an email from Defected Records from Andy Daniel just saying like, oh, we, you know, your stuff's really good. Do you want to come in and play us some stuff? So I was like, yeah, sick. Went in there and um, I had all these like really cool tech house like rollers at the time. And What uh, year was this then? Oh, this was 2013. Okay. Um, and I had some really cool stuff that was out, like a load of hype, like a load of cool bootlegs and remixes. And um, so I played them all this really cool stuff. And they were just sitting there like, And they, they were like, you got anything else? And I said, I got one track, but I don't really think it's for you guys. And they're like, well, go on and play it. So I was like, all right, cool. Played it and it was Take Me Away. Yeah. <laughs> and they all kind of looked at me and said, yeah, we want that. Straight like, away? <laughs> yeah. Wow. I was like, really? Like, okay, cool. And then um, remember about th two weeks later after they initially sent out the promos, my manager called me. And he said, listen, we need to go to Defected. Like, they sound a bit concerned. So we kind of walked into the room with uh, Andy Daniel, Wes Saunders, and Simon Dunmore. And they all kind of looked very serious and thinking, what's going on? And they looked and they kind of showed us a feedback report. And they were like, this record has gone absolutely crazy. <laughs> and we saw the feedback. We are like, oh, my God. So you th obviously thought it was bad news. It was actually <laughs> completely the opposite. Yeah. I wow. Thinking, uh oh, what's happened here? And um, yeah, they were like, listen, this has gone absolutely nuts. Like, <laughs> yeah, they didn't know what to do. Shit. What, that's... what was, sorry, what were you producing on? Like, what um, did you start producing? What was you, your first ever record produced on? Probably EJ back in the day. Which I don't know if yeah, you remember. Yeah, I remember EJ. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, I remember that. They I, had like hip hop EJ. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and yeah. dance yeah, EJ. Dance <laughs> EJ. <laughs> Wait, so that missed the complete. <laughs> yeah, mate. DAW. Was this a proper DAW? I forgot though? about this actually. What was it? It was like. It was in, was it uh, Sound One? Yeah, or... I can't remember, man. They've gone on to make. They went on to make uh, like Studio One, I think. Ah, did they? Yeah, and some other. I don't even Something know what that else. is. Oh, man. I, I, just, I, do you know what? I've, I've not heard that word for so fucking e long. Hip-hop EJ. I used, to, I used to play it all the time when I, was, when I was a kid, man. I completely forgot about that. Okay, sick. Yeah, yeah and then the uh, first term of college, we used Cubase. Oh, and then okay. the new Logic came out exclusively on Mac. Mm. Um, and then the college switched over to that. And I learned on, I think it was Logic 7, Logic 6 at the time, or Logic 7, uh, the first one. And just always just Stop being on Logic. Logic. Yeah. yeah, okay, nice. Yeah, Logic never made sense to me. I, yeah. I was, I've said this before. I, we, we did it at uni, um, recording vocals, bands, and all that sort of stuff. But when it came to kind of putting dance music ideas down onto a, a DAO, I was like, it had to be Ableton for me. Mm, same. I don't know. It's just the the I never used to work in the like the I forgot the names. The like the linear mode. What's it called? 
You've got the clip mode <laughs> yeah, enabled. Yeah, 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 I know what you mean. The yeah. grid mode. And yeah, the, yeah, I, yeah. I always work with clips and samples yeah. and shit. Rather than arrangement. In the yeah. arrangement, yeah. 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 I can't believe I forgot fucking <laughs> arrangement mode. It's not even been that long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Christ. Um, so, yeah, Logic never worked for me. But so obviously, that's, are you still on Logic now, then? Yeah. I, yeah. <clears throat> I've got loads of friends that use Ableton, and I can see the... Um, the benefits of it but I just feel for me for like the audio mixing and like vocals and actually recording stuff it's a happy medium of both mm. I think it's probably better than Ableton I, I always found recording was better in Logic than, yeah, than yeah, Ableton yeah. but I, I don't think it's actually beneficial to use Ableton for me with how my brain works, I could happily sit in clip mode for fucking three days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 30, 32 bar loop, yeah. not make anything. But if you're forced to go into arrangement, arrangement. mode, I forgot. Yeah, it. yeah. Arrangement yeah. mode, you have to make a track. You can't yeah. just fuck around for three mm. three hours or whatever it is. Um, so that's interesting. Patrick yeah. Toppin uses Logic. Fucking yeah. Denny uses. We had Denny in the other week. He said he uses Cubase still. Yeah, yeah. Um, some people like you find your your DAO. You're like you're on it, aren't you? Forever. That's yeah, kind of, of yeah. it's, it's your creative process, I guess. Yeah. Whatever helps you to achieve that the the best mm, or yeah. the easiest, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after defected, then after that. Let's so, talk about that. What happened? Yeah, after so that, after then? that, I suppose everything went nuts. Yeah. Uh, all the major labels came in. It was funny because. Um, I've I've never really come from an industry route and like I just feel the industry now is so industrialized and mm. commercialized whereas I just came from clubs pirate radio hey this record label wants to speak to you stuff blows up so it was it was it was kind of a really um different journey compared to a lot of other people that I've met in the um like coming through and doing my thing um yeah, from that, we got signed to, like, an agency. They weren't a very kind of big agency. Um, I can't remember where I was going. What was your question? Oh, well, about <laughs> after the defected record. Yeah. And you had that um, that meeting where you were shitting yourself, but then the guys were like, this is going to be huge. What was it? What's the kind of trajectory from there, then? Sorry. You? I know what I was going to say. So um, before we went to defected... We had loads of major labels interested and, oh, play us what you've got. So we actually played Take Me Away to most of the major labels at the time. And they all listened to it and they went, oh, this is brilliant, but it's a club track and it will never really be much more than a club track. And, oh, yeah, very good. Like, thanks a lot. So I was just like, cool, whatever. Like, I don't really care anyway. Um, and then we put the record out and then the same A&Rs were all calling my manager going, oh, we love this. We want to sign it. So it it was really interesting because I got a perspective into the industry where I was, I was like, all these industry people have told me something or that this is the way things are. We put the record out and something completely different has happened. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it gave me a really interesting perspective into the kind of music industry, major labels and how they actually operate, Yeah, yeah. you know, which I was really grateful for. And um, yeah, put that record out. We had, um, it just went mental. My tour schedule was mad. Got picked up by an agency. I remember seeing your name everywhere. I remember. It just, yeah. It's just everywhere. It was insane. And like, to be honest, it was just me and like one of my really good mates who was like my manager at the time. And we just had loads of fun. <laughs> <laughs> but like never really took anything seriously. There was never really a strategy. There was never, it was just like, all right, cool. Let's just go mental yeah, <laughs> had fun. I, I, yeah. what I find interesting there what you said about the the track that you kind of dismissed which obviously was the one that's affected took that kind of changed the trajectory of your career is that you never in your mind you never went in like this is the track it was kind of almost secondary to the tracks you thought they were going to pick up yeah, yeah isn't yeah. that interesting that you are you not always the tr how many tracks have we made where we've probably just gone, oh, fuck, like, even made a loop yeah, and gone, yeah, yeah. oh, fuck that. Mm. Some of the loops are probably fucking golden, but we, because we, we, I don't know, it's maybe just a self-doubt thing or a perfectionist thing, we just go, oh, never mind. And you, that's what you probably thought about that track, and then look what happened. I find this, the tracks that don't take long to make that I'm not attached to, that I'm like, oh, that, that's cool, like, I made that in 10 minutes or an throw hour. Away. Like a throwaway. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't have any attachment to they're always the ones that go crazy, whereas the ones that I spent like three days yeah. on, listen to the automation on this, like yeah. look how, rah, it just goes like, over people's heads. Overcooked, man. Yeah. <laughs> Overcooked every time. Yeah, yeah. I've said this story before, but it's, I'll say it again because it's relevant. I did a re remix for Lee Walker and he was like, oh, um, this is awesome. And I went, I've made it in like four or five hours. I really don't want to put out. It was the very start of my career. 
and I said, please, Lee, please, can I do it again? He went, nah, the deadline's tomorrow. I went, oh, fucking whatever, just put it out. It, just, it was a smaller label. Two weeks later, Corolla's playing it on the Terrace of Amnesia and yeah. it just went boom and it was massive <laughs> for my career. But it was a throwaway and I, and I rushed it, but I was just, I feel like I was in the flow. But I, I think because in my mind, I hadn't spent a week or two weeks on the automation yes. and all the yeah, other yeah, yeah. shitty stuff you can do, of like sort of detailed stuff. I was like, this isn't good enough for the market, but it was and it was because I was probably like, not asked, just like, Relaxed. I think we're we're our own biggest critics as well. So I can be really hard on myself when I, and if things come too easy, I kind of want to punish myself for it and be like, no, I got to work harder to. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So there's a lot of music actually that <clears throat> last couple of years I wouldn't have put out. Uh, not because I don't think it's good enough, just. I don't really know why. It's just like you said, it's that kind of throwaway where actually I've been putting out loads more stuff um, this year. And um, I've just found actually the reactions from other people have been like way more surprising than mm. than I thought. Nice. You know? Yeah. Okay. So so 2014, <coughs> you sign, and then you have you know a um, a, a pretty big trajectory. I only sound as, I I said, say, I heard, yeah, because I heard you said it, I mean, tra- and, I, and I didn't even say it. My other trajectory. Yeah, but you sounded confident. With it, so I thought I'd try it. Go on, try it again. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> And then, um, and then let's let's sort of talk into that. And then when we get to like 2017, you know, where you, you know you probably hit you know you hit a bit of a low point in your in in, in your career. Like, yeah, so talk us through that. Like I said, there was no real structure. Everything was just crazy with my mate that was like my management, um, and uh, the guy that was my agent at the time was like my brother. Yeah. So it was like all three of us. Uh, me and my agent just going mad, like with gigs. Um, it was just insane. And um, from 13, I'd been a big drinker. So I ended up kind of getting to a point where I was drinking every day. Uh, I actually stopped drinking at 21 just because it was so out of control. I was getting myself in so much trouble, arrested, nearly went to prison. So I ended up stopping drinking, going to AA, kind of sorting myself out for a year. Um, around 21 and at that time me and my brother started like a student lettings agency in central London as well so I I kind of started concentrating on that a bit just to get away from the club life Mm. and all the the kind of craziness of it Um, and then at like 23 uh, which was the time I started having all the kind of success I found um, opiates uh, pain pills and stuff like that and where I'd stopped drinking it kind of just hit this spot where I was like, oh, this is nice. And it was kind of, it was slow at first. It was like I'd take them every other day and then your dependency got worse. To It got to a state where I was just always out of my face. Mm. Uh, all, even in the week, all the time? Yeah, I was taking up to like 30 pills a night. Whoa. What? Yeah. What What pills were these? Do you mind me asking? Uh, codeine, any opiate-based yeah. pills. Okay. So right. tramadol, yeah. uh, whatever I could get my hands on, really. Right. Wow. But, um, I mean, at first it was kind of fun. And you yeah, don't realise yeah, yeah, you're yeah. a kid, you're taking pills. Most of them come from over the counter. So it's like all my mates are doing these dirty drugs. I'm I'm doing stuff over the counter. So it's pharmacy stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it must be okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah. You know, it's only after a while of doing that that suddenly I remember um, I remember going to Vegas, actually, and I'd been gigging back to back to back, and I'd flown back from Scotland. I was like, I, it was a last-minute thing where all my mates were going to um, were going to Vegas, and I thought, fuck it, I'm just going to book a flight. So I, from Heathrow, booked the flight, did my Esther at, at the airport, and just thought, well, hopefully it gets passed by, or cleared by the time I get to the States. Got there, didn't think anything of it, partied that night, woke up the next morning and suddenly realised, shit, I haven't got any pills. And I Uh. started going into withdrawal. Um, And I ended up in bed for like um, 36 hours, just fucked, sweating. (laughs) Like my mates had to get hotel security to check I was still alive. So that suddenly made me realise, shit, like this is now a bit of a a problem and an Mm. issue. Um, but unfortunately, it was so, everything was so busy that it was kind of like, I don't really have time to stop right now. Plus, I love it. But um, just everything got more and more out of control. Uh, my behavior would, you know, on a like Monday or Tuesday, I'd get a phone call from my management because they had a phone call from my agent because the agent had a phone call from the promoter because 
the room had got trashed or this had happened. Just really wild stuff that um, I think the problem is everyone was making so much money from mm. it that it was kind of like, well, oh, what do we do? Because I remember having a really, um, really funny um, meeting with my agency where he sat me down and he said, look, Steve, I've had this report. I think it was a, it was quite a funny thing where um, I, I don't know why, but we decided to throw take out all the light bulbs in the room, and then throw them out of the window <laughs> into like the car park downstairs. Then we got back from the gig and realised none of the lights are working, and called reception to let them know. <laughs> oh, there's no bulb. Yeah. And then- like, right, so you were the you were the <laughs> bastards that threw them all out the window. Just grass yourself up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Dang>. <laughs> So I wasn't even very good at taking drugs. But, um, <laughs> just stuff like that. I remember sitting down with my agent and uh, again, I was always just so high. You know, he tried to have, mm. have a serious con- conversation with, with me, my management, my agent at the time and just said, you know, if you do this again, you're going to be kicked off the agency. And I just kind of looked at it and went, fuck off, mate. You're, wait- you're making way too yeah, much yeah, money yeah. out of me to kick me <laughs> off. And then he didn't, he kind of laughed like, Oh, well, I suppose so. And um, But yeah, it was just such a crazy time. I wasn't looking after myself. I wasn't drinking water. I wasn't eating. I was just con- wasn't sleeping. Um, and I ended up catching MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which is a, a, a relative of coronavirus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ended up on like life support for two weeks and in a coma for 28 days. And um, at the time, everyone just thought, that's it, like, he's gone. Wow. My parents were kind of told, oh, I'll say your last goodbyes if anyone wants to kind of see him. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a fucking crazy time where I went from earning so much money as well, just on a weekly basis, to then, bang, in a hospital bed and couldn't even walk. Wow. Uh, so do you think that was enhanced because of how you weren't looking after yourself then? Obviously, yeah, Obviously, totally. MERS is obviously bad as, on its own, but the fact that your body wasn't in any decent shape because you've been touring and partying. A combination of everything, like not drinking, not eating, not sleeping, mm. hammering your body with um, drugs, and then my immune system must have been so low yeah, that you know, you're just you're susceptible to pick up anything. Did you you know, did, yeah, just on. so many <laughs> just so many things that you, you said there that are just was similarity to my own addiction there like I, I, I remember me me throwing a TV out the window at a hotel <laughs> Motley, Motley like, Crew vibes yeah <laughs> just think, you know what I mean but but just the complete disrespect for anyone thinking I'm you know here I am off my fucking off med on coke thinking it's all fun and games but someone's got to fit that bill do you know what I mean and then the same I got kicked off of so many agencies unfortunately yeah. for me I wasn't as popular so <laughs> so when I was like yeah go on try it they were like alright see you in a bit but <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I think the, the the similarities there in terms of like, you know, I mean, my vice was cocaine, uh, but it's always the same. It's the same self-destructive, yeah. selfish fucking, you know, path that just only ever leads one way, man. And and what, you know, someone actually reached out to us about your, you know, your journey. And this is why we was like, we've got to get you in to talk about this. Because I thought it was so brave of you to put that up. And yeah. this is a, a big reason why we started this podcast in the first place is that people don't talk about this shit. Do you know what I mean? All they see is SKT playing all these gigs, making these, you know, these, yeah. you know, these massive records but they don't understand you know what's going on on around it and we, we we also speak about this all the time it's like agents and managers they don't really give a fuck about anyone's welfare neither like i'm not you know i know you're friends with the guys and stuff i don't know what your relationship is with them now but but really there should be a point of care there at that point to be like you know whoa you know let's rein it in again a little bit and let's let's focus on your you know your health and you know what i think it was a lot of inexperience where we were just all kind of friends having yeah, fun yeah, 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 yeah. Not really understood the severity of what was happening yeah it's probably um, very surreal yeah you're, of course you're getting fucking paid wedge wedge yeah you're getting you got your center of attention you go to a gig everyone wants pictures with you you're like you're the guy like that's fucking hard to like yeah. control <laughs> Even at any age, never mind when you're young and impressionable and just having fucking fun with you. F- and the fact that you manages your fucking mate as yeah. well and like your other. And because of who you are as well, people just give you everything. Yeah, so there's, course, like, there's yeah, no yeah, limit. Yeah, yeah. So everyone's like, yeah, sure, have this. Yeah, or yeah, yeah sure, go yeah. there. And so it's just. Ah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
you know, until literally I just kind of hit a brick wall. <laughs> so you say so you, you say you was in a coma for 28 days? As, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Induced. I mean, I, I, this, this might be a little insensitive, but what, what was that like? You know, It was a trip. It's like I had, I feel like I went to another world and saw loads of visions and loads of crazy stuff. And also I feel like I had to mentally fight to return. Like yeah. it was within my mind to be like, all right, do I want to go or do I want to like stay here? So it felt like a real mental fight. Fuck wow, on, that's that. fucking mad. I obviously never sported. No, nah, never have I. I think so that's I, it. I never really yeah. thought about that. Because <laughs> you know, some people who, this is obviously completely um, different, but someone people who do like salvia, I'll say they, they went into a trip and they thought they went away for like three years. Yeah, it well, felt like years. What's funny is because I did a lot of research because a lot of the like visions and stuff like that yeah, were yeah. kind of quite um, disturbing or scary. Like, mm. whoa, that's weird. Um, and when you die, or if your body thinks it's dying, you have DMT in you naturally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Um, if your body thinks it's dying, it just opens the floodgates and just releases all the natural DMT that's stored in your body, which in comparison to doing like a dose or getting it externally is meant to be like, 10 or 100 times stronger. Well, I've done DMT and it was fucking wild, mate. So 100 times like that, man. And, and I've done ayahuasca, I've, which yeah. obviously has DMT in yeah, it. But, fuck, but that's obviously completely fucking that's, hell. That's yeah. crazy. Obviously, you, you can never see getting murs coming, but did you did you see yourself on this path of destruction? Did you, did you notice it at any point or were you just completely blase because you were having so much fun? I think in the back of your mind, you know, but it's like being on a train that's just... You know, at some point it's gonna derail, mm -hmm. but you're having so much fun. That it's like, all right, well, cool, fuck it. I'm, I'm in this I'm until on it. the yeah. fucking wheels fall off, kind of thing. Yeah, fuck. Yeah, for me, it was always that. My, my recognition was always the calm down. You know, I'd be like, oh, here we are again, sort of thing. But, but that never lasted for long because then it was the come up again. So Just get it a bit of a bag in. That was like yeah. So, me. so you know, you know, once you sort of. Come, come, you know, come to basically. Like, what was the journey back to where you are now? Which, first of all, is fucking incredible. Yeah, you man, know, the big turnaround. Yeah, like, fair play to you, bro. Like, you know, so, so, you know, after you come out of the coma, like, what happened then? Um, after I came out of the coma, I was a mess. I mean, I had to learn how to walk. My brain took a while. It was like it was booting up. Oh, wow. So I remember the first couple of days I got out of hospital, I had my, I had my phone back and I was trying to text. And even just, it was really strange because in my head I was like, I know how to do this, but I can't text properly. And so all that kind of slowly came back. I couldn't remember a lot of names or like I knew things, but I couldn't recall things very yeah, easily. Yeah. Um, so it took a while. I was very, very weak. I'd lost so much weight. I was like six stone or something like crazy. Wow. Because I hadn't eaten for well, a you, month. You haven't eaten. You're bed bound. Yeah. Your body just leg like muscles, itself, yeah. stomach muscles. I remember wow. going to McDonald's and I couldn't even eat a 99p cheeseburger. Like my stomach was just so shrunk. So I just spent months and months on my um, my parents' sofa. Just watching like daytime TV, antiques, roadshow. Dickens, Dickens is real, dude. Yeah. yeah, I just, I literally couldn't do anything. So, um, and it was very frustrating. Um, and then when it kind of did come back round six months later to my agent being like, all right, cool, look, you know, I'll speak to some promoters. All the promoters basically turned their back on me and were like, oh, no, his career's dead now, or he hasn't got a big record out, so we're not interested. Um, so it was literally like I went from that to six months, man. It's, long, it's actually a long time in the music industry because there's so many other kids, especially now with social media, there's so many other kids behind you, like with one track, boom, and they're ahead of you, like within a week or two weeks, it's fucking scary. So six months out, obviously you had to do it, but it, it has a massive impact on your career, doesn't it? Or your your um... mental mental health. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus the fact as well, at the time I, had, I was suffering from PTSD yeah, for like a year, course. and then I got back into drugs as well, just because my head was so fucked, and I felt like I kind of lost everything. Mm. Uh, I had no money coming in because you know I had no gigs for six months, plus all the repayments of like I had a really nice car at the time, which mm. was costing a bomb. Uh, my place so I had like thousands going out a month and like nothing coming in and yeah. I was just watching everything just go zzz, yeah. zzz, zzz. 
so yeah, it was really, really tough, but um, I took a bit of time out just to kind of focus on myself. Uh, 2018, I kind of tried to focus on getting sober, uh, started going through uh, uh, drug rehab, uh, outpatient programs and stuff like that. And then 2019, I was kind of feeling like, all right, let me let me get back into this and give it another shot. Ended up making a track called Ballers, which did uh, really well, was number two overall on Beatport, all the massive, and they were kind of like new massive DJs as well that had mm. come up, were all battering the records. And I was like, all right, cool. Like I got, a, you know, I got a good shot at this. And then um, literally towards the end of that year, going into 2020 lockdown, uh, and to be honest, that was probably the best thing that could have happened for me at the time was just God saying like, right, no, you can't do anything. You can't go out and you just got to sit around and kind of focus on yourself. So, um, yeah, that in a way it was, I'm kind of, I know it sounds crazy, but I was kind of grateful for, for that restriction yeah bro, bro just we exactly the same for yeah. us like yeah. if it yeah. wasn't for covid <laughs> it, it, I, I wouldn't be here now no I, way man. I, I was in a bad way it's very similar we're not going to go over our stories yeah, yeah. talk about we did nauseam but yeah there's nothing silly about that yeah it, it really it either was a sink or swim situation for a lot yeah. of people and we've swam luckily you know some people who haven't but we luckily have and it is it was a a, a, um, a gift yeah, yeah. Uh, it, no, obviously not in every way. Of course, that was what we, we're trying to pick our words yeah, carefully. Yeah, but yeah, for yeah. us, yeah, it could have been a sink or swim situation, yeah, yeah. and luckily it was. I suppose it gave a lot of people that were kind of on a bad path a chance to reflect and yeah, look at yeah, life. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and it was it was really good for me. Started therapy, got a little dog, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and just kind of spent some time focusing on myself rather than music. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. what's going on over here? Um, and yeah, it was really, really nice. I feel like the last 2019, 2020, 21, 22 has, have been hard years where I've just kind of been focusing and working on myself. Mm. Um, but actually what I found is the difference that then makes in my music is incredible as well. And from working on myself and kind of sorting myself out, now the music that I've got coming is back to like 10 years ago where mm. I'm like, Oh my god! Like I'm so excited about the the stuff I'm working on and that that's forthcoming now. Whereas for years it was more of a means to an end. Yeah, yeah. do you know yeah. what I mean? I feel you there. I was at one point I was just making tracks to stay relevant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I wanted to get gigs to pay the the lifestyle, and that that's not enjoyable. No, you know? no, no. It was it was like, it felt like graft when yeah. I had to go in the studio. I was like. Oh, I've got to go in the studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. not what I started like. No, I remember exactly. when when I started when I wanted to get my first release. I remember working for four months on these four tracks, and I was so hungry. And then once that had got, when it came more about like the partying and the lifestyle, and like not never, I was never never not rough. I was always hungover, so it <laughs> felt like oh, I've got to get in the studio to do this, force mm. myself. That's not how it started. But then right? also your motivation, it, your motivations become for the wrong reasons. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, I want to yeah. finish this track because yeah. I want to make sure I get booked at the party yeah. so I can, do you see what I mean? Yeah. And that becomes kind of your focus as opposed to like, right, I want to make something that I can play and people are going to react. And that's the magic for me. You know? Yeah, the, it becomes the rat race. You know, the rat race, the, a lot of people, um, you know, live their lives to, they work, to, to pay, to, to pay the bills, to go back to work. To, and that's what it became like. That's not what I started it for. I start, yeah. The tracks I was making originally was because I wanted to go to fucking Cosmic Ballrooms in Newcastle on Friday. And I wanted to play that track out to all my mates and I wanted them to fucking go, that's fucking mint. Yeah. And that's, yeah, yeah. that was lost. Yeah. After two or three years for me. Be so it sounds like you have kind of You know what happened for it. me is my audience went from this kind of young kid playing records to people <clears throat> that were into the music to the A and R's, labels, mm. publishers, managers, and all these people almost before the audience I wouldn't say gatekeepers, but they would have their opinions which would kind of almost stopped the music from just going out to mm. the people. Yeah. And I got so obsessed or caught up with all these industry people and their thoughts and everything else that I I didn't I stopped playing stuff to my mates. So I was like, well, I don't care if you like it because Universal do or this person does, so it's gonna yeah. be big. Rather than I love this record because it's going off and yeah, that excites yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. You know, so my focus, especially around lockdown, kind of got 
shifted and I suppose mentally I was a bit all over the place anyway. Yeah. You know. So 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 after that then it seems like you've come a long way since that 2017 moment. How do you look after yourself differently now than you, you didn't used to? You know, because obviously you're, you're back on the road, you're touring, you've got gigs and stuff. So how do you look after yourself now? Being sensible. Um, so I make sure now I make a conscious effort to make sure I'm eating, drinking water. I bought like a little health ring uh, thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any, any yeah. good? Really, really yeah. good. And it's, it's interesting to like, I'll check my heart rate when I'm DJing and see like yeah. where it goes and... I, I really enjoy it. I can track my sleep and stuff like that. So just being just being responsible, you know, it's mm. not um, it's kind of not hard. But when you're more concerned about drunk, like drink, drugs, and mm. you don't really think about yourself. So doing that, I try and exercise as well. Uh, I meditate as well, which I found really incredibly helpful. Uh, just small things that keeping keeping everything like that. If I feel tired, I won't go to the after party. I don't really go to many after parties now, just, I will sometimes, but if I know I'm tired and I'm at that point, I won't push it and I'll be like, right, I need to sleep. Mm. So just being responsible and kind of sensible, you know. Little things like that, that one question you ask yourself, is it really worth it? Yeah. Like, can, like that, nothing good happens really. I know this afters it does. <laughs> yeah, of course. But to be honest, I've been a lot of afters and it was fun. But yeah. nothing really good happens like at the afters when you've been there for 12, 15, 16 hours. It's the same <laughs> yeah, People yeah. talking the same Same shit. conversations yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. In the same kitchen, you're like, oh, here we go. Yeah. But but I think it is about that. It's that split decision. And, and yeah. I think another thing as well is having that that self-reflection and saying, right, you know, is this becoming a problem now? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like if you're going to the after party every single weekend and there's a good chance that's going to have a negative effect on every, not just your health, but everything else around you. Know, you know, the other thing you realise as you get older in this industry is half the people that work in the industry are attracted to the industry because you can get out if you're not. Yeah, no, mm. I, I've said that. <laughs> Do you know that, what I mean? It's so, enabled. Yeah, of the course. Man, yeah, you, yeah. I, I've, again, I've said this loads of times, you go to like Amsterdam or Miami, Miami Music Conference, which is this week, and everyone's getting on it the managers the agents the yeah, artists yeah, yeah. the promoters everyone um and it's like it's just like it's part of the a part of the culture but it's a great industry for a drug drug addict <laughs> oh yeah it's amazing <laughs> it's designed for it, yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> the, the thing is it's difficult because the industry was you know from the back of the day where you had warehouse raves and everyone was doing ecstasy and it was all about this big community vibe in a big room mm. and all doing the same thing together and it was all about love and energy and stuff so it's difficult because the industry is built on that premise a uh, little bit. Uh, on drugs but the problem is now the drugs cocaine no, no. is, is it, it's yeah. not a community no, drug, no. is it Co get like you know we have all sorts you have the core yeah. you have cat which is obviously GHB and yeah, all, you know yeah. what i find now with all these kids the trend seems to be ketamine cat yeah. man oh. and like i just you would see oh, yeah yeah i don't understand why do you want to go to a party on ketamine yeah yeah because like literally everyone's just standing there yeah. Yeah. No. It is it, on the youngins. At least yeah. with like yeah. ecstasy, people. Yeah. yeah you're like, no. yeah, you're oh, loving it. You're raving, they'd be, aren't yeah, you? they'd be yeah. with you, but yeah. people, you know, it's a disoactive. This, this is yeah. this is associative. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so it's like you're not even connected to yourself within where you are. So mm. I just feel like that's having quite a big effect on the actual rave scene as well and the type of music. When you look out to the crowd, and if sixty percent of them are ketted, they're just like, <laughs> literally. <laughs> <laughs> and it's built enough and everything yeah, no, it yeah, has yeah, an effect yeah. on the energy in the room yeah, it does, oh, yeah. especially if you're, in a, if you're in a small room as well and you need that energy and everyone like i i, I completely agree but people like, aren't present they're, no, they're, no, they're, no, they're, no, no yeah i mean i'm i'm fucking being a massive hypocrite here because i was pretty yeah, much addicted yeah. to ket that was my thing yeah, yeah but it got to a point where if i had a bump of ket it was like me having like a few sips of a beer mm. it wasn't but the, you go to like big raves now i've said this before you like all the young ones uh they just they got this blank look on their faces yeah I know. it's, it's not like they're crazy. doing little bumps to like in, <laughs> they're, they're doing, they're doing rails on the on their iphone in the middle of the crowd and it's just fucking <laughs> it's, it's different yeah steve what would be your advice to like any kids coming up in the industry what you know who want to have a successful career I would say you got to do what you're doing from a place of love or because you love doing it because, you know, as we've said, if you are doing it for any other reasons, there's just so much bullshit. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You probably won't make it kind of thing. So yeah. it has to be really because you love and you're obsessed with, with what you're doing, for me anyway. Mm -hmm. you, know? you know what? Yeah. I, we literally had, on the last guest, <laughs> we had exactly the same answer. Yeah, yeah. It's not a quick, same, no, I'm no. not joking. 
pretty much where that first bit it was exactly do it from a place of love and be true to who you are and I think as well these days so many people are making music that people can kind of feel it within the energy of the music if if you've put your kind of heart and soul into it as well you know it makes a difference for me absolutely okay so um Let's let's talk about now, like what what's going on. First, I want to ask how you ended up in the studio with James Haskell. <laughs> oh, he's a legend. <laughs> yeah, I met him in um, Ibiza earlier this year at a defected event, and um, I was DJing. We just got chatting. We got on really well, and he said, "Oh, I'd love to love to jump in the studio with you." And I said, "Yeah, sure." So we ended up doing um, doing a session down at um, Defected. And actually, we've made something that is actually one of the biggest tracks in my sets at the moment. Um, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Because I see it pop up. Was, but you know what's funny? Take, it's like though. before I'd work, I'd work on, oh, he could do something for me. Or mm. it, it was kind of a trade or like that makes sense because if I do this, then he'll do this. Whereas with James, I actually just got on with him and I thought, you know what? I actually vibe with this guy. Mm. Let's just do something for fun. Yeah, with yeah. no expectations organic, organic yeah, yeah yeah and I've just found the more I pay attention and I work like that the better the music is and yeah, the more natural always. everything is and the better it does rather than trying to oh I want to do this and does that make sense yeah no of course you know if it's forced especially if you're in the studio with someone else you know it, it comes across force as well in the end product yeah. doesn't it you know um, just on that is there anyone else you'd like to work with in the uh, in the studio doesn't necessarily it could be another rugby player <laughs> 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 any more rugby players you want to work with yeah um, you know who I'd really like to work with is MK Mark Kinchin um, I've loved him and he, he supported my stuff really early on he was one of the like big DJs that jumped on a load of my stuff and um, he's still playing. So he's playing some of the new records as well, yep. which is really, really cool. And I, I just love his, for me, he's like one of the almost like originators. Yeah, so I'd yeah, love to yeah, just yeah. get and um, get in the studio with him and watch. Um, someone else I worked with recently who was amazing was Todd Edwards. Um, oh, wicked! Yeah, and like I've, I was a big fan of his from like twelve, thirteen, uh, like playing all his records. So to sit down and watch him do the, his cut up sampling thing, that um, you know he's involved with um, Daft Punk's album, yeah, yeah, well. sang on that. So like he's insane. Um, so I always like working with different people just just for what I can learn. Uh, recently, I was working with a sixteen year old kid. And um, it was funny, actually, my publisher called me and said, oh, there's this kid, we think he's really good, we're thinking of signing him, can we throw you in a session? So I was like, all right, cool, Like, I'll do it for you guys. Went down there, and the first two hours, the guy was just fucking around, where I was thinking, like, I'm, I want to kind of make something out of this, and um, I was like, oh, don't worry, it's going to be sick, it's going to be sick. Sat there for two hours, and I'm thinking, oh, God, it's such a fucking waste of time. And then out of nowhere, bang, he just hit on something where we were all like, well, what was that? <laughs> and then it just came. And it was, so, it was so good for me, I feel like, being around for so long, you lose that kind of natural, very um, organic process of how to make stuff because you can start overthinking yeah. and feel the pressure of, I need to make something. I've been in there for two hours, like, ah. Oh. And then you're kind of at a lost point because then mm. it kind of never comes. So that was really interesting to see. So yeah, I love I love just working with different people and seeing how their brains work and how they tick, you know? Yeah. Do, do you prefer working in person with people? Or in doing like, instead of doing, I'll send you a project, you send it back, I'll send it back to you, I and doing that kind it. of back and forth online. You know, sometimes the distance is actually nice because um, working with a vocalist at the moment from... Um, Manchester who's insane and um, having just that that distance he'll send me something and then I'll kind of sit on it listen to it sit on it refine it and then go back to him yeah whereas sometimes if I'm in the studio it's kind of oh you do that uh," and then you leave and then kind of think oh actually maybe this would have worked better or do you see what I mean so pros and cons are supposed to both yeah yeah absolutely yeah Absolutely. Okay, so like since you know you've been in the music industry, how has your um, perception changed of it as a whole? 
I think the whole industry's changed massively. Um, it's all now being led by a kind of social media. To be honest, a lot of the, a lot of the major label A and R people have got very lazy. Instead of actually kind of uh, developing talent and working with talented people, they'd rather find someone with three hundred thousand followers mm. on TikTok, TikTok and then go, yeah, yeah. "Hey, how would you like a record deal? Yeah. And we'll give you these songs from this publisher." Yeah, we've heard this a million times. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's so true. Man. Yeah, I think the problem is now what they're finding is actually these people don't always sell records, yeah. <laughs> and they well. also, if they do. Do one big hit, they can't follow it up because it's got they've got no substance to them. So I get it. It's kind of like a lazy thing of oh, this can work. Um, but I think at the same time, what they've done is devalued their brand, and then their marketing and promotion and credibility can't actually sell anything direct. Yeah, yeah. So then they're like, oh shit. Well, now we kind of have to rely on. So I think the whole industry is changing um, so massively. And before. Um, I'll use this for, for an example, like my product was this, my product was a record, vinyl, CD, that's what I'm selling to you. Whereas now my product is me. Yeah, you're the yeah, brand. Yeah, yes, yeah, and yeah. music is an extension of that, you know? Secondary, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I yeah. said this before, you are the brand and the music is secondary. Mm. If the music's class, you've got a full package, but first and foremost, you need 150,000 followers, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is crazy. So, yes, yeah. so, I mean, what's the thought process you go through choosing artists and tracks for your own label now just stuff that i love so anything that i think i can play out and it will go mental um i'll sign yeah so i try not to go via like genres or this or that just if the music's good and i like it i, I can play it in my sets and i'm down to sign it do you i mean but do you feel that pressure as um, a, you know, a, a label owner now of like knowing that you can, you, you need to be looking at TikTok or is, you, do you know what I mean? Do you, do you feel that pressure, that additional pressure that obviously back in the day you wouldn't have had that? I, when it comes to the label and even my own productions, I don't really look at anything like that, to be honest. For me, it's just about nice. good yeah. ideas and tracks that I think the problem is if you start then chasing this success, you just end up going down a really bad route mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, this is trending, so let me remix this. And it's, it's for me, I try, I'm try. i not trying to concentrate on success. I just want to enjoy my life because I've had so many times where I've been making fucking crazy money and I've been so depressed. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And from the outside, the success would look like, oh my God, this guy. I remember people saying to me as well, God, you're living the dream. Like you've got the birds, you've got I the hear that. You're living, you're living the dream. You yeah, and them. I'm basically a drug addict <laughs> fucked all the time thinking, <laughs> mate, if only you, <laughs> yeah, if only yeah. you knew. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so like for me, all that stuff is just kind of by the by. I've had it, it's great. Um, you know, if I have it again, great, but it's not my motivation mm. and it's not my focus. My focus is really on the art and just making records that people can really love you know speaking of that then have you got any uh, records that you love that you're releasing soon that we can talk about or any anything coming up that's exciting you want yeah to i've got the record with uh james haskell um i've got um, is it signed is that already signed not signed at the moment um but this is a great thing because i have my own label i yeah. can kind of be really reactive and to be honest with you i found last year i worked with a load of labels good labels very well-known labels but it was just all a shambles, you know, where it's like, I'm then phoning the label or emailing them, hey, have you got any feedback on the track? Like, has this DJ got it? Has this person, oh, I don't know, I'll find out. And then three days later, you don't hear anything back and it just kind of deflates you. So I've kind yeah. of just taken things into my own hands a bit more and I'll put out my own records. I'm working directly with all the promo people and it's kind of like our own team. Uh, You're you know? in control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely. Yeah, yeah so, um, yeah, I've got loads coming. Uh, I've got something coming on Insomniac uh, in rotation, uh, which is a, it feels like a really, really big track. Um, something with Nervous Records. And then to be honest, just I've got probably about 10 records there that I'm really, really excited about. Some that are signed and some that I'm, I'm still kind of um, in the process of signing. But from now until um, Mid June, I've got releases every three weeks. Nice. Oh wow! So I've got something on Solo Toco as well, uh, Sonny Federa's label. Yeah, shout yeah. to him and Electronic Nature as well. Oh, wicked! I see so, you've got a busy schedule. Yeah, bro. <laughs> yeah. but you know what? It's it just feels like fresh music. It feels like almost like a two point oh 
Um, and I can see looking back where I kind of got lost, not to say that anything was bad or wrong, just in, in my perspective, where I want to be and what I want to be doing. Yeah. Like I feel now on point. But you wouldn't be where you are now if, you, uh, if obviously you've been through a fucking lot, so I don't want to speak on, on, on that, but the journey that you've, if has been t the journey that you've been on has got you to where you are now. Mm. Yeah, you, for you sure. You seem really happy with the music you're making. You're locked in. You've got your releases going. Your label's fucking sweet. You feel you just speaking to you now. You feel very confident in what you're doing, which is great to see. Yeah, yeah, and like confident in myself. Yeah. Mm. You know, and I don't need any. Um, how can you say it? Like, uh, I don't need any acceptance from anyone yeah. else. I'm just doing what I do and what I love. And if you like it, great. If you don't, I don't care. Yeah, perfect. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So such a nice place to be in that. Yeah, well, you know, it's in in the industry because it is so difficult to get sucked down into that. You know, you need that external validation from yes. everything, which is like no one starts making music for that, do you? The thing but is, when when you're on drugs as well, your head's always fucked. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You're yeah. standing there at like a big festival playing to 30,000 people. It's going fucking nuts. You come off your best mates like, mate, that was fucking insane. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but there was a guy standing still. Because my head's just like, no, that wasn't good enough. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's nice to actually be in a place where none of that really uh, bothers me yeah. as much, you know. Yeah. Much more present, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. man. Well, mate, well, um, we always end the show with, um, because we're called the afters. We yeah. have to ask you your um, maddest or funniest after party story, mate. You can um, make it as elaborate or as simple as you like. Go for it. Um, you know what? There's, I'm tr just trying to think what I can actually say. Um, <laughs> I mean, as far as we're concerned, you can say whatever the fuck you want, but it's, I mean, yeah, I, you I, would be reserved I, if you want. Yeah. I remember, um, I remember one year in, um, in Ibiza and, um, it's, it's already started great. <laughs> 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 I know this is going to be good. It was like at the time where I was like on top, I was playing for, um, defected, uh, records at Amnesia, uh, you know, alongside loads of big acts and um so i got put in this like really swanky hotel arrived they had like a bottle of champagne for me and like all the reception like the hotel people were like pleased to see me and oh wow and um so i got really friendly with a guy on reception who was um him and his girlfriend did uh, like 12 hour shifts back to back so he would do eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night then she would do the night shift so uh on the night of the gig saw him during the day at reception he said oh God, can i come i said yeah 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 he said don't tell my girlfriend so i said yeah yeah no worries so anyway t took him out he turned out to be the biggest nutcase you can imagine oh, no. after a couple of drinks so we all got back to the um the kind of suite at like six o'clock in the morning the sun was coming up balcony door was open blasting music there was about 20 of us in there and you could see outside everyone was coming down putting their like towels out and um about 7 30 there was a big knock on the door and we're like shit fuck. open the door and it's a receptionist bird and she's like where's my boyfriend and we're like oh but we're like we haven't seen him <laughs> so anyway apparently he ended up um he ended up disappearing and then getting arrested or something so she had to do like a 24 hour. And you got blamed, <laughs> and you got blamed for it. <laughs> oh no. So do, when you went out with him, was he, were you, was he with you for ages or did he just fucking? He was, all, he was out with us for a bit and then he had a couple of drinks and then he just went off the, you know, you, you know everyone's got that one mate that just disappears yeah, and goes yeah. off the off rails. Off the rails, yeah. And he was that guy, yeah. And um, <laughs> Almost cod eye, like they have like cod eye. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They're just looking through you. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> no idea what's going on. Fucking oh hell. mate, well look, Bro, thank you so much for, for, for coming on. Oh, no worries. Thanks for having so, me, man. And I just want to say, it's, it's super inspirational journey that you've had. And, Absolutely. Um, you know, especially just how brave it was to put that that post out and let everyone know, you know, that it's not always black and white in this industry. You know what's nice? So it feels like it's behind me. Now. Yeah, exactly so that. Yeah, it's like a part I've of your worked, life. Yeah, 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 I feel mate. like I've worked through it and yeah. it's taken a bit. And it was quite frustrating because I feel like a lot of people in the industry will look at me and then go, well, how come he never got up there or you know if you look at my traje trajectory and path um so it was kind of my way of saying this this is why like 
this is what happened. Yeah. I fucked up. I'm kind of making um, kind of peace and closure with yeah, it as good, well. Man. You know? That's good, man. And I, I like that as well, you know, because that's the same how I look at my own addiction was like, it was just a part of my life that I've, I've learned from and now I'm a better person for it. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. yeah fucking fair play to you. Nice one. Nice one, mate. Cheers. Sick. <laughs> Does anybody know where the 